Okay. So thanks for joining everybody. Um, today we're very honored to have Dr. Thomas Nutman join us, who is the chief of um, laboratory parasitic diseases in NIAID NIH and my boss and a leader in all things filariasis. And he's gonna be talking to us today about um, lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis. And feel free as we talk to either put your questions in the chat or to um, just speak them at the end. All right, Tom, take it away. Okay. Just parenthetically, I, I, I don't seem to, the way I'm sharing my screen, have access to the chat. So so if there's a chat comes in, just let me know. We will, yeah, we'll be happy to okay. yeah, share that with you. All right, so um, thanks everybody. Um, uh, and um, uh, thanks to Adrian and um, Elise for um, twisting my arm to uh, um, give this uh, presentation. Um, I was asked to talk about onchocerciasis and lymphatic filariasis. Uh, um, I think largely because it are these are two infections that uh, not everybody sees uh, commonly, even um, uh, th those uh, among us who um, um, take care of uh, um, patients post-travel. So anyway, I thought I'd start with a case uh, presentation um, that maybe illustrates a little bit of the problem, and then and then I'm just going to launch into a discussion of both onco and lymphatic filariasis, um, and then. If there's time at the end, I'll come back to the patient. Um, um, but this is a pretty typical thing that, that at least um, I've seen over the years. So this is a 25-year-old uh, uh, male Peace Corps volunteer who noted the gradual development of Mark swelling of his left leg three months after beginning work in northeastern Gabon in West Africa. He reported that the swelling was painless and restricted to the left lower leg. And it began after a stinging insect bite. Um, 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 that insect bite caused a papule, um, which decreased in size and resolved, but the leg swelling persisted and eventually included the entire left leg. Um, laboratory tests done, um, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, in Africa showed a white count of 25,000 with 48% of eosinophils. And um, antibodies that were sent to our lab here um, showed that there were eleva elevated serum antifilarial antibodies. So he was referred here um, um, about eight weeks after the initial onset of leg swelling. Um, and uh, the only thing I want to note, because um, I don't have a picture, um, is that um, on PE he, uh, physical exam, he had a left, uh, uh, he had a couple of inguinal lymph nodes that were enlarged that were freely mobile. Um, um, when we did measurements of his legs, um, you can see that his left leg, either below the knee or above the knee, were significantly uh, more uh, swollen, had a bigger circumference um, um, than did the right leg. Um, and on, um, and showed non-pitting edema without any warmth, tenderness, or lymphangitic streaking, and uh, the scrotum was not appreciably enlarged, and there was no hydrocele. So I'm going to use this as a sort of just a just kind of a, a, a guide or a framework um, to uh, talk about both uh, the clinical aspects of lymphatic filariasis and uh, onchocerciasis. Um, both of which, by the way, could present um, um, like this, um, um, and then um, and then um, and really talk about the clinical aspects uh, as well as um, 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 some other uh, things uh, related um, um, to this infection. These infections. Um, so, uh, just uh, to sort of uh, get us all on the same page, there are actually eight. Um, Filarial, infection, uh, filarial species that infect humans. Um, 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 there are two Brugia species, uh, Bancrofti, uh, um, and then Onchocerca, Loa, and Mancinella. Um, and uh, the top four there, the top four species there, um, are, are the ones that cause, generally cause disease in humans. Um, and you can see the numbers of people uh, infected um, uh, or estimated to be infected uh, uh, on, on the right there. Um, these are neglected tropical diseases. Uh, and I always point this out that they're neglected by everybody, but largely German metal bands. Um, 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 but for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to talk about um, um, the the uh, lymphatic filariasis and onco, uh, largely from a clinical perspective. 
So um, sadly, uh, um, um, it's important to know a little bit about the life cycle of uh, these parasites. Um, the lymphatic filarial parasites are bloodborne, um, and the microfilaria um, 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 live, uh, uh, circulate in the blood, and they're picked up by, in the case of lymphatic filariasis, mosquito vectors. There's a two-week uh, um, um, uh, maturation phase in the vector, and then they uh, when they take a, a female mosquito takes a, a, a blood meal, um, they deposit these infective stage larvae or L3 um, and uh, um, in the skin um, and they migrate in through the through the through the wound um, and um, and then ultimately uh, travel through lymphatics um, 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 where they uh, mature and ultimately uh, mate males and females mate and produce microfilaria. Um, this period between the, um, and I'll get to this in a second, the period between the infection and the time that the microfilaria um, um, show up um, is called the prepatent period. Um, um, and it becomes very important um, to know this um, um, when one is thinking a little bit about uh, um, making a diagnosis, particularly as in the case I presented, um, when you are um, um, uh, before the level um, where before the time where you would actually expect to see microfilaria in the blood. Um, Onchoschiasis um, is um, um, the adult worms actually live in subcutaneous uh, uh, nodules, and I'll show you some examples of that in a, in a little while. Um, and these um, uh, produce microfilaria that typically live in the skin. Um, and then, um, and then, in this case, a black fly takes uh, a blood meal and picks up the micro uh, the microfilaria in the skin, and then the life cycle um, goes uh, as as in the previous uh, slide uh, about 14, 10 to fourteen days of maturation, and then reinfection of the human, and then and then uh, uh, then they they move ultimately um, uh, to mate in in these subcutaneous nodules. And produce microfilaria. Um, so, um, for all parasitic infections, I kind of think a little bit about about this um, and um, what is the earliest time to patency in um, in humans. The meaning from the time one is actually exposed to the time one actually develops a patent infection. How long does it take? And and we're just going to talk today about um, uh, these two and. The, the data uh, for this um, in the case of W. Bancroft and Brigham Lay, I come from um, studies that were done uh, pre-IRBs where um, people were deliberately infected with um, um, uh, Brugium laei primarily, um, and then and then uh, uh, followed. These are these uh, so-called you know they were not so they weren't controlled human trial uh, uh, human infections at the time, but they were they were um, um, uh, deliberate infections of humans, um, and a couple things were learned. Um, more importantly, so the so the so the prepatent period, uh, the earliest prepatent period for W. Bancroftian and Brigham Malayi is probably on the order of twelve to fourteen weeks. Um, so from the time one is exposed to the time um, um, one um, um, develops a let's say a parasite that you can. Um, look for in the blood or the skin of an individual, um, um, you know, takes time. And I want to really focus on Oncocircovolvulus um, because uh, from data, there aren't, there aren't human data, but there are human data from a uh, an experimentally infected chimpanzees. Um, um, and this really goes along with whatever we've sort of, um, um, the sort of clinical observations that, um, um, for microfilaria to appear in the skin um, from the time one's infected to the, uh, is, is um, on the order of um, um, 30, 30 weeks. Um, that's the earliest time. Um, so, so when you think about patients um, um, and making diagnosis, you really have to know um, um, when there was exposure, um, when their exposure is, and, and actually um, 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 when it is likely to, um, um, you know, you, are you likely to see um, um, parasites um, that you can use for diagnosis? 
So um, I just uh, put up here the, the, the maps of, um, uh, of the endemic regions of the world. Uh, these are WHO maps from 2017 or so um, 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 about where we find uh, lymphatic filariasis um, and where you find um, onchocerciasis. Um, 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 suffice it to say that uh, lymphatic fluoride is found in the tropics and subtropics um, across uh, uh, the, the world. Um, and uh, onchocerciasis um, is really right now limited, um, despite the map there, is really limited to Africa and Yemen. Um, um, there's only one small focus of onchocerciasis left in the Americas, um, and that's on the on the Venezuela onchocerca, uh, Venezuela Brazil border among the indigenous population um, of, of 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 the world. Just to keep in mind, onchocerciasis essentially has been eliminated um, from the Americas. And I just uh, point out where Gabon is, which is where. Um, 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 this patient that I, I told you about was from. Okay, so um, I'm just going to sort of dive into this um, 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 from a clinical point of view. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the clinical aspects of both lymphatic filariasis and onco, and then I'll talk about diagnosis and treatment. Um, so um, lymphatic filariasis is caused by three uh, organisms, Brugia malayi, Brugia tumori, and W. bancrofti. Um, they, they all have um, mosquito vectors, and there can be multiple species of uh, mosquito vectors. The microfilaria are uh, bloodborne, um, and the uh, meaning that they they're found in the blood vessel, you know, in the peripheral circulation. Um, but the adult worms live typically in the afferent lymphatics. Um, the prevalence is about 130 million um, even now, um, and the geographic distribution, as I showed you, was in the tropics and the subtropics. And uh, for W. Bancrofti, humans are really the only um, uh, host um, for Brugia malaya and Timori. Um, both humans and um, um, and some animals um, can be the reservoir of of of, uh, Brugia, of the Brugia species. So from a clinical aspect, the sort of the sine qua non of, um, um, of, of, of uh, infection uh, or symptomatic infection is filarial adenolymphangitis. Um, it's very hard to get photographs of this. Um, um, the thing to remember for those of you who um, 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 have to take uh, uh, infectious disease boards or, or other things is that um, among, uh, uh, that this is um, that, Filarial adenolymphangitis actually is retrograde. So typically the inflammation uh, starts in the uh, uh, proximal lymph node and then extends distally out um, down the, um, you know, uh, um, um, down the leg or the arm um, in this case. Um, um, and it's to my knowledge, the only, um, the only um, kind of retrograde um, adenolymphangitis that, um, um, that is described. And it's, it's, it's probably, and it's, and, it's, and, it's a, and it's a sort of a sterile um, um, adenolymphangitis. So it's sort of pure, um, pure um, it's not bacterially induced um, it's, it's, uh, or commensal induced. Uh, it's, it's really a, um, 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 something we don't absolutely understand, but it's an inflammatory process that starts in the lymph node and moves distally. Um, the most common um, <clears throat> manifestation, uh, a clinical manifestation of, 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 of lymphatic fl flareal infections is actually an asymptomatic or subclinical form of the infection that's associated with um, um, high levels of circulating microfilaria. Um, and I just uh, show you what these actually look like um, if you purify them and um, you know and put them in uh, tissue culture. Um, but I, I put this this uh, uh, this uh, a picture here of a W. Bancrofti um, a, a microfilaria in the bloodstream, and I like to even though this is sort of artifactual, I I I, I, I like to point out the fact that it in general doesn't induce a lot of inflammation, um, and so they're not surrounded by cells in this case, um, um, and they live quite happily. So it's the true sort of host parasite um, um, interaction. The parasites uh, don't drive a lot of inflammation, and and um, and um, as a consequence. Um, they are there as a reservoir for continued transmission. So if you go into an endemic area, um, 70 to 80% of all um, individuals who are infected will have an asymptomatic or subclinical form of the infection. The 
But what we're, everybody remembers um, or knows about this uh, infection is that it's, it's associated with lymphedema or you know, swollen uh, limbs um, um, in particular, um, and it's a progression. So um, in the earliest situations, um, as you can see on the left there, um, you know, uh, there's a person that uh, has a, 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 what I'll call early lymphedema and it's unilateral. Um, so the other piece to remember is that that uh, filarial lymphedema is almost always um, asymptomatic, um, as, um, is um, 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 asymmetric. Um, and so, um, um, so I think very commonly, um, you know, if somebody presents with bilateral, I, you know, uh, uh, lower extremity uh, swelling um, that's uh, symmetrical. Um, it is that is probably enough to say that it is not um, it is not um, a filarial infection. Um, um, but that being said, just keep in mind that that this is that this is um, typically an asymptom uh, asynchronous. Um, I'm sorry, that this is typically a um, um, asymmetric um, lymphedema. Now, over time, um, this relatively benign, um, um, benign um, uh, looking uh, lymphedema that's reversible typically with um, elevation um, uh, moves into a, a, a less reversible form uh, um, where you begin to get this sort of brawny um, looking um, um, appearance of, 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 of this leg. Um, and, um, and, um, and then over time, um, um, this can progress um, when you begin to see some of the some of the sort of verrucous changes, the the hyperpigmentation um, that are that is probably secondary to this. Um, 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 and the point here, of course, is that um, that. Uh, uh, to go from early lymphedema to, to this kind of a thing takes um, oftentimes uh, decades. Um, um, so it's a longstanding progressive uh, kind of uh, 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 process. Um, um, and then in its worst case scenario, in a sense, um, you have this uh, individual who um, has massive, um, both uh, scrotal, penile, and, um, and um, uh, 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 lower extremity um, elephantiasis. Um, and I like to just mention, sorry, I like to just mention the fact that this, um, 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 that this person's other leg is 100% normal. Um, and uh, despite this uh, terrible uh, disease, and this is all related to the fact that the parasite, the, the adult parasite actually lives in, uh, 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 actually has tropism for particular lymphatics. And it's actually the anatomic location of these adult worms and the inflammation um, in, the, in a particular anatomical location um, that drives um, what happens. So in this case, it is very likely that, the, that in the inguinal and pelvic lymphatics uh, on, on one side um, is where all of the blockage is, um, and leaving um, this other limb um, completely normal. Now, um, 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 in W. Bancrofti infections, and not so much in Brugge infections, there's, a, there's genital disease beyond um, um, you know, the elephantiasis. Um, so hydrocele is probably the most common manifestation of uh, W. Bancrofti infection. Um, 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 but uh, 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 um, but um, and, and then you can get um, the, what's called, um, 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 you know, uh, Kind of the, the sort of lymphatic chylus um, um, material that 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 ends up um, uh, weeping out of the the male genital um, areas, um, and women can be certainly um, um, uh, uh, affected uh, as well, um, um, and we think that that's a, a very underestimated. Um, uh, genital disease in women, at least, is, is really very un underestimated, um, given the fact that it hasn't actually been studied or looked for very carefully. Um, um, one other um, unusual manifestation of, uh, of W. Bancrofti infection or, or lymphatic filarial infections is tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. Um, this is a syndrome um, um, that's associated, it's a systemic uh, illness, really, um, that's associated with paroxysmal nocturnal asthma. 
pulmonary infiltrates, uh, high grade eosinophilia, marked elevations of serum IgE, and very high um, antibody titers. And, and we think of this as a, as a hyper, kind of a hypersensitivity reaction um, to um, um, filarial infection. Um, and typically what happens is that um, um, for whatever reason, the parasites, the microfilarias they're released from the adult worms um, get cleared in the lungs in the first pass because they're opsonized in some fashion by uh, extraordinarily high levels of antibody um, that somehow get trapped in the capillaries of the lungs and then induce an inflammation. Um, um, the good thing about this is there is a, a, a rapid response to anti-filarial um, chemotherapy. Um, 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 so if one recognizes this as a syndrome, um, one can take care of it. Um, pretty uh, readily. Um, 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 in the literature and um, in general, um, 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 you'll see two terms. Um, the, the one I talked about, um, adenolymphangitis or ADL. Um, and this is really exceedingly uncommon, um, 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 even in highly endemic regions of the world. But what's most common is this thing that we're calling DLA or dermatolymphangitis, um, which really is um, um, felt uh, to be um, secondary uh, uh, in, uh, infections, uh, be, them, be they from, from um, skin-dwelling um, microorganisms or, um, um, or um, fungi or, or you know, a number of different um, things. But what happens is that there's a low-grade chronic um, infection um, and inflammation um, where you then and then you get recurrent bouts of what looks like cellulitis. Um, and, um, and then what happens is that this, uh, this lymphangitis actually is much more like, um, um, let's call it bread and butter um, lymphangitis, where, where almost all of the inflammation starts um, distally and then moves towards the lymph node. Um, and you can imagine that even with the mildly poorly functioning lymphatics, um, 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 the skin ends up being um, this source of entry lesions. And this is uh, one of the sort of um, um, big problems in patients with um, um, significant lymphedema, um, um, whether it's really due to, due to um, um, a flare infection or, or other causes, um, um, and, and this just shows some obvious obvious places um, where one can um, acquire, where one has to pay attention ultimately um, if you end up having to having to take care of any of these patients. Um, so one other thing I like to point out um, when I talk about these infections is that um, when you when you give what I think I have given was is much more of a textbook um, um, sort of look at at, um, you know, a lymphatic filariasis in this case. Um, 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 uh, what, what we've come to understand over the years in, in almost all of the filarial infections, and I think it was driven a lot by our, our work on Loa Loa, um, but, but um, there is really difference in the clinical um, manifestations of those um, who were born in, in, in indigenous um, uh, regions of the world, um, filarial indigenous regions of the world, um, or uh, in travelers to those, those regions. And, um, and so uh, in the case of lymphatic filariasis, and I'll get to Anko um, uh, in a little while, um, um, travelers are much less likely to be um, asymptomatic or subclinical. They're less likely to have the adenolymphangitis, um, 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 and they're le less likely to progress, um, not um, progress towards um, lymphedema or elephantiasis, largely because they come to medical attention and typically get treated. So I'm going to turn now um, to onchocerciasis in terms of the, the clinical and kind of epidemiological sort of um, um, uh, feelings, um, and then and then we'll get. To the uh, to other aspects of this, so onchocerciasis caused, as I meant, onchocerciasis is caused by onchocerciasis. As I mentioned, it's a black fly that transmits it. The microfilaria typically live in the skin and in the eye. Um, the adult worms are not in lymphatics, but are in subcutaneous deep nodules. The prevalence uh, maybe is is up to about thirty nine million people. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the geographic distribution is really primarily now restricted to Africa, a small part of Yemen, and a small remaining foci on the Brazil-Venezuela border. And onchocerciasis, onchocerca, um, um, really is only found, the 
constricted lobules only found in humans. Um, 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 though, as I mentioned, some non-human primates, particularly chimpanzees only, um, can be infected um, experimentally. So I mentioned that, uh, so onchocerciasis is mostly a skin and eye disease, um, um, as well as a potentially a lymphatic, um, or involves lymph nodes um, or lymphatics. Um, 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 but the hallmark is a papular um, a dermatitis, um, um, a, a, which is depicted here. Um, 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 and I think uh, it's pretty obvious. The problem is that it's really very um, nonspecific. And if you look here at um, one of the, a traveler who acquired um, this infection, um, um, you could imagine that uh, the per person presented to a dermatologist typically, um, oftentimes a year or two after travel, because of the, um, 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 and, um, and they, you know, it's, it's, nobody knows what it is. They either don't get a history of the travel, um, it's very nonspecific, they put topical steroids on it, it doesn't get better, um, it's itchy, um, and it's really nondescript. But the point being that, uh, um, you know, it, like everything else, um, sort of, um, it's important to just keep this in mind, um, and particularly this idea of this pre-patent period. So the time from exposure to the time of presentation with symptoms can often be years um, in, these, um, in these travelers. Um, I, I need to point out that, uh, that the skin um, inflammation is extraordinarily pruritic. Um, this is just an example of uh, the kinds of um, uh, the, uh, pruritus that, uh, that drives the scratching um, um, in, this, in this particular patient. But if you talk to patients, it is actually the pruritus that, that um, not the rash per se, but the, the pruritus that um, 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 is maddening. And it, uh, it, it really has a huge impact on uh, people's lives um, in, in endemic regions of the world. Um, with sort of chronic longstanding um, 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 the, uh, microphilodermia, as we call it, um, and inflammation in the skin. Um, you can see um, um, you can get this hypopigmentation. Uh, uh, typically, it's on the on the anterior portion of the um, of the shins. Um, people call this um, um, you know, leopard skin, um, um, and um, um, and and. While we say that it's a hallmark of the of the uh, of, of um, onchocerciasis, which it is, um, I'm 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 becoming more and more convinced that a lot of this is actually secondary changes uh, to scratching um, and inflammation caused by scratching, and um, 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 because you almost never see it in in, in the places where uh, fingernails can't get to. Um, um, but um, suffice it to say, this is uh, certainly something that you see with chronic uh, longstanding onchocerciasis. And on the on the other side um, is the sort of peau d'orange uh, 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 manifestation um, that one can see with any sort of longstanding chronic inflammation from cancer to, um, um, you know, to obviously um, um, onchocerciasis. So there's a form of um, onchocerciasis, which is called um, um, uh, localized or reactive onchocerca dermatitis. Um, this is um, a person's uh, uh, two um, legs. Um, um, and um, it's also known in the literature as sauda. Um, sauda is the Yemeni word for black. Um, and this in some ways is like a, is, is like a, um, is like the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia of, of onchocerciasis. It is a, is a, it is a hypersensitive, um, a hyperreactive um, 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 uh, state in which um, there is an exuberant um, inflammation that tends to um, um, rid the patient uh, to some degree of, of the parasites, um, but as a consequence um, ends up with this, uh, uh, um, with this uh, really marked um, um, uh, post-inflammatory sort of state um, um, that's driven largely by um, uh, an immunologically hyperreactive um, situation. So um, I mentioned that it's that it's uh, the skin disease that's uh, that is the hallmark, um, but um, other 
manifestations are um, these onchocercomata, um, um, and in this uh, um, boy, you can see, um, I hope, um, a number of uh, subcutaneous nodules, one, two, three, has a few others, if I remember correctly. Um, and these are where the adult worms live. Um, the males and the females um, um, are encased um, in a relatively acellular um, um, fibrous capsule. Um, and um, 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 but this is where all the action takes place as males and females may produce, you know, thousands of microfilaria a day that then populate the eye or the, or the skin and cause disease. So this is what actually one of these looks like if we remove it surgically. Um, so you can see that there's not a lot of um, inflammation. Um, um, it's really a fibrous sort of collagenous capsule that contains uh, males and uh, male and female uh, worms. Um, uh, if you collagenase this, um, you can see what happens. And these are these are what the these are what the adult worms look like. Onchocerca females are about um, can be up to three meters long. Um, I should mention, if I haven't, that uh, filaria means uh, thread-like, um, and so all of the filaria worms um, are um, um, thin, elongated um, organisms. Um, so the you know Ankylosaurus is also known as river blindness, and um, and really the the uh, the thing that we work we've always worried about. Um, 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 uh, uh, in onchocerciasis is the eye disease. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, the early manifestations of um, anterior chamber disease. This is, um, um, these are called punctate keratitis or snowflake opacities. And what these are, are um, 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 an inflammation around um, um, microfilaria that are, um, 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 that are localized to the anterior um, portion of the eye. Um, over time, um, um, as these microfilaria, we believe, die um, and incite even more inflammation, um, you can see that uh, you end up with uh, panis formation, loss of pupillary architecture, um, and, um, 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 and, um, and um, um, really uh, serious um, um, eye disease. Um, not only is, is there anterior chamber um, um, involvement, um, but there is also chorioretinitis um, um, and optic uh, neuritis that's associated with, uh, um, uh, with onchocerciasis. Um, and, um, 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 but overwhelmingly the, the eye disease um, that is, is most prominent um, is um, anterior chamber um, um, uh, uh, disease. Um, but the blindness is really, and the blindness is really due to sclerosis and keratitis. Um, so um, shown here is a um, person with that. Um, um, I want to say that largely um, um, this is no longer a big problem um, given the mass drug administration campaigns uh, for, for, for Onco, but, um, but um, um, up until five or 10 years ago, this was um, the second leading cause of uh, uh, infectious blindness uh, worldwide behind, uh, behind uh, trachoma. Um, some unusual manifestations of onchocerciasis um, is this thing called hanging groin. So if you, if you have the lymphadenopathy that is associated occasionally with um, onchocerciasis, um, on top of the um, atrophic or elastic skin that's, uh, that is, is, is found, um, um, uh, um, uh, as a consequence of the inflammation in the skin, um, you can end up with a manifestation that looks like this. Um, in the interest of kind of being um, uh, um, up to date, um, I think it's important for you all to know that um, 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 that um, in the last five or 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, interest in something called onchocerciasis associated epilepsy. Um, and uh, something that we were very interested in called the nodding syndrome. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're aware that there is a strong epidemiological evidence of an association between heavy ovovulus infection and epilepsy, primarily in children, and that there is this existence of nodding syndrome, which is an epidemic form of early onset atonic, atonic seizures, which I, I, I 
I'm, I'm not doing justice to it, but but uh, suffice it to say um, that uh, uh, both these are on what we would consider to be Oncocerca associated epilepsy syndromes. Um, thanks to Dr. Schuller, um, 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 when she spent a year uh, with us um, um, pulling together some uh, data uh, related to Oncocerca um, in travelers or and, and endemic um, people, um, um, we could actually put some numbers to the differences between um, the infection in endemic individuals and temporary residents. And shown here is just a, um, um, a, a table of, um, from a paper that she wrote. Um, 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 showing that um, that um, those with uh, the the symptomatic um, uh, or, or the symptoms associated with with um, um, uh, onco in either endemic or individuals in temporary residence was were, were, was different. The presentation um, was different. Um, um, uh, temporary residents were more likely to have rash or paritis um, than were the endemic individuals, and, and endemic individuals were more likely to have visual disturbances um, with onchocerciasis. Um, and I want to just point out the fact that the limb swelling was was common, um, even though we don't think about onchocerciasis as being being associated with uh, lymphedema, let's just say. Um, but it turns out it's it's moderately frequent. Um, 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 and uh, this just goes on, on a little bit more um, to talk about actual uh, physical uh, uh, um, findings in, in the two groups, just to point out the fact that uh, temporary residents and endemic individuals typically manifest um, infection slightly differently. Um, and you have to be aware of that um, in general. And so just sort of summarizing that piece of it, um, you can see that um, um, uh, Onchoscus is an endemic individuals um, are much um, still more likely to have um, a certain set of, of, of findings um, than are the travelers. Okay, so um, that's the clinical picture. Um, uh, just check the time. Okay, so I want to just now move on to sort of say, well, what do you do if, you, if you're considering this as an infection? Um, and how do you make the diagnosis? So like all parasitic infections, definitive diagnosis is, is uh, at least in filaria infections, is detection of the Parasite, or in the case of uh, the microflare and the blood in the skin, in the case of W. Bancrofti and in the skin for Oncocerca volvulus. You can identify the adult worm on a biopsy specimen. Um, there's now PCR using species specific sequences and good tissue. Um, and for W. Bancrofti, there's a circulating filarial antigen. I'll show you some examples of that in a second. And then, and then there's um, the situation where you have to make the diagnosis presumptively, um, typically using um, serological means. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, we typically um, um, uh, use a one mil uh, for bloodborne filarial infections. We use a, a, a little nucleopore membrane filtration device where you put a mill of blood through this device and you pull out the, pull out the, the, the um, the filter and put it on a, a, a slide and then you stain it. Um, and this is what these look like typically. Um, and the nice thing about this is that the, you put a mill through and you collect all the microflaria. So you actually get a quantitation of the, of the microflaria besides being able to identify which species uh, perhaps um, 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 is responsible um, based on their size and morphology and whether they have a sheath. Um, I want to remind you that um, for the bloodborne and for W. Bancrofti in particular, or, uh, um, um, and Bruchia um, to some degree as well, um, that there is a periodicity. So W. Bancrofti appears, uh, the typical W. Bancrofti, particularly the strains in, in most of the world, um, uh, circulate in the blood and peak in the blood um, um, at midnight. Um, and by noon, they are down to zero. Um, um, and so if you're, if you're um, looking for microfilaria of W. Bancrofti, um, you actually have to draw the blood at a time when the parasites are uh, in the blood. And this makes, uh, makes it very difficult, both, uh, both here and, and uh, in the field, um, if, if you want to use this as the, as the, as the way of uh, looking at um, infection. Um, for Onco, we typically use a skin snipper. Um, this is a, a, a repurposed corneoscleral punch biopsy. Um, we, uh, it takes a bloodless one millimeter, deep one millimeter 
wide um, um, biopsy, um, and we typically take uh, four to six um, um, of these. We, you can, if you don't have one of these, you can tent up the skin and slice it off uh, with, uh, with a scalpel. We put this in um, uh, tissue culture media, um, um, and um, within 24 hours, but typically earlier than that, the, 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 the um, microfilaria emerge. Um, and, um, and you have your diagnosis. So that's Onco, sorry, I'm having, yeah. So for W. Bancrofty, I just, you can find the adults. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why this is not, my movie's not working. Um, um, I'm sorry that the movie is not, uh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so what this is is um, 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 you can find the adults um, um, uh, invasively in the case of um, this person who went for hydrocele surgery, and you can see the adult, um, the adults wrapped up in the lymphatic uh, in the scrotal lymphatic of this particular patient. Um, this is actually an experimentally infected gerbil um, and um, using live imaging, and you can see a dilated lymphatic and the adults uh, living quite happily. Um, and then this is ultrasound, um, which we use um, not a scrotal ultrasound um, uh, with, with Doppler, um, which um, um, allows you to see um, the dilated lymphatic in the um, um, uh, on ultrasound, and you can see the this what we call the filarial dance sign um, of this adult worm um, uh, dancing, if you will, um, um, in in the in the in the dilated lymphatic of, of this case in the scrotum. So this helps you make the diagnosis. Sorry. Um, I mentioned um, circulating filarial antigen, um, and this is what we like to use um, most commonly, particularly in the field. Um, this is a um, this is not available in the U.S. as a diagnostic tool, um, but it is really good. Um, so this is a rapid diagnostic test. It, this was the initial form, and now it's uh, called a FTS, or um, 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 and. Um, and the beauty is that you don't have to do this at night. You can do this on a day. It's a, a single blood spot. Um, and it has sensitivities and specificities that are in the high 90s. Um, and it's an antigen test, so it tells you whether or not you have an active infection. There's PCR, um, and I'm not going to go into this. This was a small little study that was done maybe 10 or 15 years ago here at the NIH. Um, um, our own lab here does um, uh, qPCR now for, for um, for um, all the you know, all the important filarial species, um, suffice it to say that um, it is a um, uh, it's more it's 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 highly specific and more sensitive um, than um, parasitological means. So so um, we think it's going to be uh, what people are going to use in the future. The biggest confusion that people have um, um, is on serology, um, um, and um, and our lab has been involved in doing a lot of the serology. This is an old slide from the 1980s, um, making the case that if you do, if you send out blood for a filarial specific antibodies, um, you'll get an IgG or an IgG4 antibody. Um, um, and the, the, the idea is that the IgG antibody is quite um, sensitive. Um, it picks up all the different filaria, um, but it's also uh, um, not very specific. And you, you, lose, you pick up a lot of um, uh, non-filarial nematodes, even occasional trematodes, or even some protozoa. There's some cross-reaction. IgG4 is a little bit better. Um, you get, it's, it typically is much more specific for filaria, uh, for the filaria, but, um, um, but it doesn't speciate um, and, it, um, and, and it loses some degree of sensitivity. And this is just data from, um, um, from a lot of different individuals showing that the, the sensitivity of the standard antifilarial IgG is high, but the specificity is low. G4, the specificity is high, but the sensitivity is low. Um, and, um, and so um, now currently where things are going is that we're trying to, to kind of uh, 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 deconvolute, if you will, um, these false negatives and false positives. 
um, and um, and what you're going to see in the future is, um, or really, it's 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 right now, um, you know, certainly in in our group and other places, um, to use multiplex flareal specific serology. So not only do we do the the, the standard antifilarial IgG, but we also now use recombinant antigens to essentially identify the species, um, um, uh, the offending species of, 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 of uh, causing the infection. Um, and for some of these recombinant antigens that are what these multiplex are based, they're now um, 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 RDTs, um, again, not available in the United States um, easily, um, but where you can actually um, make the diagnosis or help make the diagnosis um, um, you know, rapidly on a, on a blood spot or um, you know, on, a, on, a, on a finger prick. Okay, so that's the diagnosis. What do you do um, in terms of treatment? Um, 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 so onchocerciasis treatment is typically ivermectin, 150 micrograms uh, per kilogram in a single annual dose. The goals of, and, and we know that probably up to five years is, is uh, five years is sort of the minimum number of years you need to, um, to um, continue treatment, um, um, at least in the travelers. Um, the goals of therapy is obviously to ameliorate skin disease, prevent blindness, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this at the end, uh, to interrupt transmission if it's used with community-directed treatment, um, uh, annual, you know, whole population um, distribution. Um, I want to talk a little bit about doxycycline. Um, doxycycline is, um, um, as we all know, it, um, it you know, it, um, it antibiotic. Um, but for the case, in the case of the filaria, and particularly uh, W. Bancrofti and Anca circa, um, um, they, the adult worms in particular, but uh, all stages um, have a Wolbachia endosymbiont, um, um, and this is an intracellular rickettsial-like bacteria, um, and six weeks of doxy. Um, um, are, is actually adulticidal, or if not adulticidal, is actually uh, um, what we call macrofilariostatic, meaning that it renders the adults um, um, uh, uh, incapable of producing microfilaria, and ultimately they die of, um, call it old age. This is just a picture from uh, originally a picture from uh, the Lancet that um, colleagues of ours uh, did um, in the first trial uh, phase, I guess, three trial or uh, trial to show the efficacy of doxy and Oncocerca. This is an Oncocerca nodule um, um, taken out of a patient before therapy, and, and this arrow is pointing to the intracellular. This is this is an Oncocerca worm in cross section, and these are. Uh, uh, Wolbachia um, found intracellularly here. Um, and this is, um, uh, I think, uh, two years after treatment. And you can see that the Wolbachia are gone. And, the, and, and we, we can say that the, that the infection in this case is, uh, is largely uh, taken care of. For lymphatic filariasis, um, the goals of therapy are slightly different, um, um, or how we treat people are actually based on what, what they're, what they're symptomatology is um, asymptomatic microfilaremia. We, we, the subclinical form, um, we want to uh, treat um, in order to uh, prevent uh, 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 lymphatic damage um, and ultimately to interrupt transmission because um, humans are the reservoir. In people who have um, um, who just have adult worms and don't have a lot of microfilaria, we want to prevent lymphatic um, damage. Adenolymphangitis, we obviously want to prevent irreversible lymph, uh, uh, lymphatic damage. Um, and for chronic manifestations, if they have active infection, we want to reverse or stabilize um, those chronic manifestations. And TPE, it's actually, uh, treatment is actually curative uh, and will prevent the secondary pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there are a number of um, options for uh, LF treatment, but the treatment of choice um, 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 in the individual patient, in, at least in the United States or um, um, Europe, um, is diethylcarbamazine at six to eight milligrams per kilogram for 14 days. Um, um, it uh, turns out that um, albendazole and for 21 days and doxycycline for six weeks um, um, are, is also quite effective um, at uh, uh, not only uh, reducing symptoms, but also um, killing the adult worms. Ivermectin is a, is a purely um, 
microfluoricide in, in lymphatic filariasis. Um, um, and some people have been using it to treat, but um, it's not a it's not a good um, it's not a it's not a good um, substitute for these other other uh, other possibilities. Um, in in um, mass drug administration campaigns, um, um, single dose combinations of ivermectin and albendazole, albendazole and DEC, and now um, what's now called a triple drug or IDA, ivermectin, DEC, and albendazole is actually um, what is being used um, for sustained um, um, sustained microfilaria suppression and presumed re reduction in transmission um, in these mass drug administrations. I didn't talk about this, but um, there's a new player on the horizon um, called moxidectin. Um, it's not yet been approved, FDA approved um, for um, lymphatic filariasis, um, um, but it's a think of it as a long-acting ivermectin um, that seems to have much more sustained uh, uh, effects on um, on the microfilaria. Um, um, and trials are underway. I know from um, meetings that were at in the last couple of days um, in lymphatic filariasis as well. Um, so. One of the things that always comes up um, in terms of this discussion of lymph, um, um, lymphatic um, filariasis is uh, what do you do when you have this uh, these largely irreversible um, 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 uh, morbidity um, and really and truly what um, everything that that that's happened over the past little bit has pointed to the fact that um, really good hygiene, um, it can actually stabilize or actually reverse um, um, a lot of the lymphedema um, or lymph a, a lot of the serious consequences of um, uh, lymphedema. Um, and so right now, hygiene, exercise, elevation, shoes, bandages, and treatment and prevention of skin lesions um, is probably the, 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 the way that we're um, um, moving forward, at least around the world. Um, and even for the patients um, here in the United States um, or elsewhere, um, um, I, up until a few weeks ago, I would tell you that there's a, a, a really nice study um, showing that uh, six weeks of a, a trial that showed that six weeks of doxycycline um, was um, useful um, in um, reversing to a small degree uh, lymphedema in, in patients. Um, we were part of a, a six country, 2000 person placebo controlled study um, comparing um, doxycycline with and hygiene plus or hygiene alone. Um, and um, I, while it's not yet out there exactly, it's, it's unlikely that doxycycline is gonna um, um, be um, a huge tool um, in the in the in the treatment of uh, uh, in the reversal of, of, of longstanding lymphedema. Um, I always like to put uh, put this out um, that out there um, in certain parts of the world. Um, um, people um, will um, do venonodal shunts um, 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 for severe um, 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 elephantiasis. You typically uh, anastomose the saphenous vein to an inguinal lymph node and essentially bypass the obstruction. Um, and even though this is two, these are two different patients, as you can imagine, uh, right and left. Um, what this is is actually somebody um, 24 hours post that venonodal shunt. Um, um, and the thing I like to sort of point out is that um, when you do this, you get this massive um, um, fluid shift. Um, and so if you're ever involved in helping a surgeon take care of these patients, um, it's important to note that if they do this kind of procedure, um, that you have to, um, you have to inc monitor their their fluid balance um, incredibly uh, carefully in the first uh, you know week or so of, of the surgery because um, you can you know uh, you know can have uh, forty or sixty liters of uh, interstitial fluid that gets mobilized post surgery. Um, very quickly, um, onchocerciasis um, prevention and control. I mentioned uh, CDTI or annual ivermectin mass drug administration um, for onchocerciasis. This is what's been responsible for, for um, the elimination of um, onchocerciasis from, from the Americas and it's uh, the, what's going forward in, in all of the rest of the world. 
Um, there's mass drug administration for lymphatic filariasis. Um, um, we use albendazole and DEC everywhere but Africa. Um, we use albendazole and ivermectin in Africa because DEC, I should have mentioned this, is, is contraindicated in onchocerciasis because of what's called the Mazzotti reaction. Um, and then um, um, and then um, in, in, all, in, in, in parts of the world where there is no um, onchocerciasis, this new triple drug or IDA um, is what people are using um, for um, control um, and ultimately elimination, which is the now 2030 goal um, for both onchocerciasis and lymphatic filariasis. So um, I will end um, except to say that I just will tell you about the patient I presented to you, um, 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 and then uh, very quickly. Um, so um, this was actually a patient that we saw in the 1990s, I guess. Um, and um, 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 and uh, shown here is the is the um, um, uh, an MRI of, 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 of an early MRI of, of, of the soft tissues of, of, of his upper leg. And I think you can see the difference in, in um, size. Um, uh, C here uh, shows you the, the lymphocentigraphy. Um, I didn't talk about lymphocentigraphy, um, but we, do, we have used this a, a, a fair amount um, to, to, to distinguish between lymphatic obstruction and uh, venous obstruction, for example. And what you can see here is what's called, um, 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 sort of let's call it the, the, so on this side, you have a completely normal um, um, movement of the tracer that gets put in the ankle um, or webs of the web space of the toes and, uh, and uh, goes up to the inguinal lymph node. And on the, on the affected side, you can see that um, there's, a, there's a, a both slowly moving um, radionuclide, but also just um, this, uh, what's called backflow um, because of the pressure at the, at the area of the lymph node. Um, and, um, um, and so um, this actually was, um, um, you know, true lymphedema in the patient that I, that I presented. Um, 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 and so um, I don't have time to go into all the details, um, what we ruled out um, Oncocirca and some other, other things. And what this turned out to be was what we call pre-patent uh, W. Bancrofti. So um, it turns out that in all these studies where people infected themselves or their colleagues, um, 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 in the first uh, several weeks, um, 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 as the L3s move to the lymph node, it actually induces um, a, a transient um, lymphedema. Um, um, and uh, we were able to use, um, in this case, some, um, um, some um, specific serology for early infection um, to show that this, in this case, was a W. Bancroftian infection um, that, um, that um, with definitive treatment, in this case, diethylcarbamazine, um, um, within, um, I can't remember, I think three months, um, everything completely normalized um, post-treatment. So I think with that, I Great. Am... Thanks, Tom. That was a great talk. Um, I'm just going to jump in because there's several questions and I think maybe we could quickly get through a few. Okay. Um, I'll start with the hardest one. It's from a Peace Corps medical officer who says, what are your recommendations for screening volunteers after service for either of these infections? They do a questionnaire primarily yeah. aimed at LOA, but that's about it. Obviously it depends on where you're, depends on where you're, where you're, where you're, where you're from. Um, we would probably um, suggest uh, um, do um, that it's uh, a, a questionnaire is sufficient. Um, 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 we don't typically routinely um, suggest sort of kind of you know mark antibody screening um, unless it's from a you know a, uh, unless it's from a um, you know a known highly endemic region um, 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 and so we would we would await uh, you know typically I, I'm pretty sure that the Peace Corps you know at a minimum does a CBC and I guess if there were preferably a cinephilia because it's very common in 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 travelers um, um, who have acquired um, any of the um, not only flare infections but really any of the helminth infections um, to have um, either a low grade or a significant eosinophilia and it would be I, I suppose it's not there's no good 
there's no great evidence to say that 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 would be sufficient but but i would say that we would use that as a as a sensitive and not very specific tool to sort of prompt um um uh, let's say appropriate serological ass assessment great okay so the next one is about um the periodicity and basically if there's um is a jet lag if you will when somebody yeah. leaves an endemic yeah. area i didn't mention that um so um um we know from studies that uh, uh, i know i've talked to a good number of people about this in the past we know from studies when um airlines uh when airline travel was um um uh airline travel uh was more very common and um blood banking was finally safe um, that they did these experiments where they took um, um, blood from a microfilaria patient, microfilaria positive patient in one time zone, flew it to a, a new time zone and, and infused it into, into a patient, um, and then looked to see how long it took to, uh, to reset the clock. And it's about two weeks, um, largely, to go from, um, so, so if somebody's off the plane, you know, from Africa, for example, and you're looking for microfilaria, you need to draw it on local time. Um, but if, uh, but, but once you have the two weeks is probably the, 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 the time to go from, from, you know, um, to completely equilibrate um, from an old time zone to a new time zone. And um, I guess I always tell the story about the fact that uh, also they did these experiments where they put um, a microfilaria person, microfilaria positive person in a, one of these day-night reversal chambers. For some of you older folks, um, these were parts of psychology experiments that people would, would do where they were just trying to, trying to see uh, about circadian rhythms. And, um, um, and, um, and again, it was about two weeks uh, for this, uh, this person who was day-night reverse to, um, to actually um, switch their periodicity. Great. Um, how long is an adult female fertile for? The question is about how long skin snips stay positive after a person leaves an endemic area. Um, so the, um, well, so the lifespan, let's just, first off, the lifespan of the adult female is um, in Onco is probably on the order of 15 to 20 years. Um, and the lifespan of a uh, 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 Bancroftian um, uh, adult is more like five to seven years. Um, but in the case of, um, um, and, and the other thing that we know is that microfilaria um, probably have a lifespan in onco of about three to six months. So you could expect even if you killed the adult worm, um, that there would be microfilaria present um, in the skin um, and not be repopulated um, um, for up to six months. Um, for Bancroftian filariasis, um, I think it's less than that. Um, the lifespan is probably more like three months. Um, 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 so if you were able to kill the adults, um, you would want, uh, you know, efficiently, you would, um, you, you probably wouldn't, um, want to be um, sampling the blood, uh, let's say, you know, um, um, you know, early uh, post-treatment, because um, it, it will give you a false sense of whether your therapy was effective. So we, for example, in our patients, whether it's LOA or Bancrofty or whatever, we don't actually look um, post-treatment um, um, at any parameter till about six months. I mean, you know, um, 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 from a parasitological point of view. And maybe just one more, one last quick one, um, and maybe any other residual questions people can email Dr. Nutman directly, um, is about whether DEC fortified table salt um, used in endemic areas was um, effective. So it was. Um, so that's how China eliminated um, uh, lymphatic filariasis. Um, um, it was used hugely successfully in. Um, um, in some of the uh, Caribbean islands, um, 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 and it's actually a very, um, it would be a very appropriate um, um, approach to elimination. The problem has been that uh, it's cheap. Um, the problem has been that um, it, for a variety of reasons, it is taken um, from a political point of view, it, it actually took, um, um, it took the, um, 
um, what's the word, the, the, the communist regime in, in, in the 60s and in, 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 um, um, in China to um, mobilize and insist that everybody uh, in every province of uh, China um, use uh, this DEC fortified salt. So it was essentially it was it was not it was not for the fact that it wasn't a, a perfectly solid way to interrupt transmission. It was the problem is actually that um, um, it required essentially 100% of the salt um, in, in in a country to be uh, DEC fortified. Okay, on that note, thank you so much. Um, additional questions, again, can go um, e be emailed directly to Tom, and we'll be posting this as, as soon as we're able, probably by Monday. So thank you so much. I'm so glad I forced you to do this topic, Tom. It was great. Um, and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.